I'm Andre, and I will give a talk, talk on Dissection BKW, which is a joint work with Felix Hoyer, who is also attending the audience today, as well as uh, Robert Kübler and Alexander May, all from Ruhr University Bochum, and Christian Sola from Technical University Dortmund. So let's start with the definition of the problem we will focus on today. We've seen this problem also in the talk of Shafi Goldwasser the learning parity with noise problem, or for short, LPN problem. And for this problem, we are given an arbitrary amount of samples, where a sample consists of a randomly sampled vector from F2 to the K, here AI, and together with a label. And this label is the scalar product of this random vectors with a secret vector plus an error term. And this error term can be 0 or 1, and it's 1 with probability tau, which is strictly less than 1 half. And the goal is now given an arbitrary amount of these samples to recover the secret vector S. So why is this problem important for us? Of course, the common use hardness assumption is that this problem is not solvable in polynomial time for an error rate that is high enough. And so it forms the basis of, of a lot of cryptographic applications. So for example, there are authentic authentication schemes as well as encryption schemes based on the hardness of the LPN problem. And as soon as this is the case, we need to understand how hard this problem is actually solvable of course, to determine proper parameters for the mentioned schemes to ensure certain security levels. So the state-of-the-art algorithm to solve the LPN problem is the one by Bloom, Kalai, and Wassermann from 2000. And this algorithm has the advantage of a slightly sub-exponential runtime, while it has the drawback of a memory and sample complexity that is as high as the time complexity, so slightly sub-exponential. And this makes the algorithm quite impractical. I mean, there have been some experiments done in 2016 and 2017, but all were restricted to a very small dimension due to the huge memory requirement of this algorithm. And if we now want to estimate the concrete hardness of suggested parameters for this problem, we need to rely on experimental data. And as long as these experiments are restricted to such a small dimension, we yeah, get some estimates that are quite in, inaccurate, and so we want to present a BKW variant here that is applicable for any given amount of memory. So we will achieve this by giving time memory trade-off, first time memory trade-off for the BKW algorithm, which of course will reduce the memory complexity while we have to suffer a slight increase in time complexity. So first I will illustrate the BKW algorithm, and or a slight variant thereof, and before I do so I would like to emphasize its core idea. And this is if we're given two samples, A1 and A2, with corresponding labels, we can simply add these samples component-wise to obtain a new sample. So this just goes off the linearity of the scalar product. And it's worth mentioning that the new error term E prime, which is now the sum of both previous error terms, is one with a higher probability than before, but we don't care for the moment. We just keep in mind we can add samples to create new ones. So the algorithm then starts with a list containing these AIs as rows and starts searching for pairs that have a special form, namely they shall end on the same pattern of bits and, uh, or as we will call it, they shall be equal on a stripe and the algorithm then proceeds by adding these samples together to form a new sample that ends on zeros. And then the algorithm continues searching more pairs behaving the same until it generated a list that is as large as the initial one. And then it can simply start all over again, doing the same procedure for the next stripe and the next stripe until just one random bit is left. And with a good probability, this bit is one and we have a lot of unit vectors. And what can we do with unit vectors? Okay, if we have a unit vector and we look at the label, which is the scalar product of the secret with the unit vector, which is obviously just one bit of the secret here, the first, plus the error term. And since this error term is strictly less than one half, even if we add samples together, it stays strictly less than one half, if we have enough of these unit vectors, we can do a majority vote for one secret bit. And if you analyze this algorithm, you will conclude that it indeed has a slightly sub-exponential runtime of two uh, to the k over log k, uh, so also memory and sample complexity. So how do we construct time memory trade-offs from here? Um, for this, we need one main observation, and this is the following. We do not need to restrict the algorithm to just form pairs of vectors to eliminate a stripe. We could also allow the algorithm to sum up three or even more, let's say, C vectors to eliminate such a stripe. And 
The advantage should be that this uh, number of combinations of C elements uh, increases exponentially in C, and so does the number of combinations that adds up to zero on such a stripe, and so we are able to start with a smaller input list. So in the following, I will give a framework that uh, does not restrict the algorithm to just forming pairs of vectors, but allows to sum up three, uh, three or even more, let's say C, uh, vectors to eliminate such a stripe. And for this reason, we need to define the C sum problem, which is a known variant of a, or a variant of a known, well-known problem in computer science. So it's not new, but we define it slightly differently. So um, and this is just given a list of size n containing uniformly distributed elements from F2 to the B, where B is now the width of such a stripe. Find n combinations of C elements that each add up to zero. So finding a number of these C sums that adds up to zero that is as large as the initial list. So as seen for the original BKW or the slight variant we've seen, solve the two sum problem by finding an amount of two sums adding up to zero that were as large as the initial list. And um, yeah, to ensure a solution to our problem, we obviously need n to be sufficiently large, since otherwise there don't exist enough combinations. And since the expected number of combinations adding up to zero on a stripe is n choose c over two to the b, since there are n choose c combinations of c elements, then the probability that one sum is zero on a stripe should be two to the minus b. And so we need this to be at least the initial list size to, be, to make the problem solvable. And solving this for n gives the lower bound on n of two to the b over c minus one. And since we want to start with the smallest list size as possible, we we'll use exactly this value for n. And here we nicely see the dependence of uh, n to uh, b and, uh, on b and c. So if we start with a, uh, if we increase c, we can indeed start with a smaller list size, but if we increase the width of a stripe, we have to increase our list size again. So keep this in mind, and the main idea is now to solve the CSUM problem repeatedly on each stripe and just, uh, instead of just forming pairs of vectors. So, oh, okay, we need one more observation uh, to, uh, before stating the framework, and this is we have to understand where actually the time memory trade-off comes from since till now it looks like a memory reduction technique for the algorithm, but it, it uh, unfortunately has a drawback. And this is the following to understand this, we have to go back to the original BKW algorithm, which forms pairs of vectors to eliminate a stripe, and it does so in each iteration. So in the end, we have constructed a unit vector, or a lot of unit vectors, that are the sum of two to the number of iteration samples, since in each iteration we take two vectors from one list to form an element of the next one. And as I told you in the beginning, if we add samples together, we increase the error term. So the error term of the final unit vectors is much higher than the one of the initial samples. What I did not mention is that the BKW algorithm somehow operates on the limit of adding samples. So we cannot afford to add more than these A samples together. Otherwise, we would lose the slightly sub-exponential runtime of the algorithm. So if we now start adding three vectors, for example, together, we can start with smaller lists, smaller lists of all iterations, but we have added too many samples. So we have to compensate somehow, and, and this is done by increasing the width of a stripe, which then leads to overall less iterations. Uh, and for proper spreading of the stripe, we will uh, end up with a sum of A samples again to construct the unit vectors, as in the case when, build, uh, when just building two sums. So, but as we've seen before, if we increase the width of the stripe, we have to increase our list sizes again, and this is exactly what we will lose in time complexity. So, now we are ready to state the framework. Okay, it should be relatively clear how this works, but we have to make an observation here. So, we start with a list of size n, and then we repeatedly solve the CSUM problem until we generate unit vectors, and then we can do a majority vote for one bit of the secret. So, the observation here is that the time and memory complexity of, uh, or first the memory complexity just is dependent on the initial list size, which we've seen is just dependent on the choose and see some instance. And the time complexity of this algorithm, or this algorithmic framework, is just dependent on the algorithm used to solve the see some problem, as long as we do not iterate over too many stripes, but we won't. So we can conclude that the time and memory complexity of our algorithmic framework are equal to the time and memory complexity of the algorithm used to solve the CSUM problem. 
So knowing this now, we can concentrate on algorithms solving the CSUM problem, and we will do so, and then plugging them in into our framework and forming time memory trade-offs. So let's start with a very simple, naive algorithm solving the CSUM problem, leading to our first time memory trade-off. So uh, it's a nearly brute force approach. We call it CSUM naive algorithm, and it does the following. It just computes all C minus one sums of the list, search the sum in the list, and if it exists, it can store the corresponding CSUM. And this algorithm has obviously a time complexity upper bounded by n to the C minus one, since it has to compute all C minus one sums. And the memory complexity is n for a properly chosen list size, n as we've seen before. So using this algorithm now inside of our algorithmic framework to solve the CSUM problem, we get an algorithm solving the LPN problem. And these are the time and memory complexities of this algorithm, so the exponent of the time and memory complexity. And we see that in comparison to the original BKW, we uh, achieve this log C factor in the exponent, so it's increasing logarithmic in C, and the memory exponent is decreasing nearly linearly in C. That's quite nice behavior, and if we illustrate this in a graphic where we plot time over memory, we see that the coordinate 1, 1 corresponds to the original BKW runtimes and memory complexity of uh, k over log k. And if we now plug in, or you can also achieve this complexity by plugging in c equals two in our equations. And if we now plug in higher values for c, let's say c equals three, we get a point to the upper left, as expected from a time memory trade-off, reducing the memory complexity exponent while increasing the time complexity. So for even higher instantiations of c, we will achieve these instantiations of our framework. So in the following, we want to concentrate on more sophisticated algorithms solving the CSUM problem. And for this reason, I'm going to explain the idea of Schröpel and Shamir, or to be more specific, what we will see is a heuristic version of uh, Hogarth, Graham, and Ju. This algorithm is especially designed to solve the foursome problem, and so it will just offer one instantiation of our framework. But uh, there is a more general class of algorithms forming an abstraction of the schröpel shamir technique, which is called dissection, and this will offer more instantiations for our framework. But for a brief understanding, I will just concentrate on the schröpel shamir te technique. So the first observation we need is that if we are searching for four sums in one big list, we can simply split the, lists in, uh, the list in four equal parts, treat it as four different lists, and start searching for four sums just between these lists. So one element from each list. And what we will lose is a polynomial factor of four sums not affecting the asymptotics. So we can just treat the problem like this, and what the algorithm then does is, is it uh, combines two lists at a time, and it does so by matching the lists on a specific pattern on the last bits here, zero, zero. And also it searches pairs, one from each list, that adds up to zero, zero on the last bits. And the same is done for the write two lists, and then uh, the middle lists are combined in the same fashion so that they add up to zero on all coordinates. So we have generated our first four sums here, and obviously the last list is not as large as the initial one, so we have to uh, compute more four sums somehow, and the algorithm does so by starting all over again and matching the base lists to a different pattern on their last bits. So same pattern is used for both lists, and this, uh, yeah, then the lists are again combined to form a solution on all bits, but note that by construction, if we take a vector from the left and from the right middle list, they add up to zero on the last bits. So the constraint for the last uh, level just holds on the first not matched yet bits, and we generate an, an expectation the same amount of solution vectors. So and in particular, it does not matter on which pattern we match uh, on the middle level. We can just repeat this for all different patterns to do an exhaustive search for all four sums met, uh, matching to zero. And for properly chosen list size, the initial list and the output list size will be equal after doing the exhaustive search. 
So this algorithm has a time complexity of n squared in comparison to the naive approach, which had a complexity of n cube. And there is this more general class of algorithms I mentioned, which is called dissection. And the algorithms of this class have, in general, a runtime of uh, n to the c minus square root of c. And yeah, in comparison to the naive approach, which had a runtime of n to the c minus 1. So an overall improvement. And it should, therefore, lead to a better time memory trade-off. And indeed, it does. So if we now use the dissection algorithms, so the members of the dissection class, to instantiate our framework, so the subroutine for solving the CSUN problem is now dissection, or the dissection algorithms. We achieve this time and memory complexities, where we have the benefit of this 1 minus 2 over square root of c factor in the exponent, which is obviously less than 1, and therefore improves the trade-off. So again, illustrating this in the graphic, where we see time over memory. Uh, if we now use the schreppel shamir algorithm to instantiate our framework, we achieve this instantiation mark at lying at 2 thirds, 4 thirds, instead of 2 thirds, 2, meaning we decrease the time exponent from 2 to 4 thirds, which is a quite nice improvement. And using the other members of the dissection class, we achieve these instantiations, lying all beneath the previous trade-off and therefore forming a better trade-off. So, here are some lines illustrating the behavior of the trade-offs. But uh, I want to mention that if we are memory-wise somewhere in this region, uh, so, lying, so we have ma more memory available than we need for building four sums, but less memory than we need for building two sums, uh, we have no instantiation besides the schroppel shamir variant of the BKW, so the green instantiation mark at the end of the red line. So we would like to have an algorithm that is able to leverage the effect of an increased memory by decreasing the time exponent again. And to overcome this issue, we give a slight generalization of the dissection technique, uh, which we call tailored dissection, since it's tailored to any given amount of memory. And yeah, this technique was independently discovered by Itai Dinua at the same time. And uh, yeah. It works as follows. So it's applicable to any algorithm of the dissection class, but again, I concentrate on the schreppel shamir technique. So what can we do if we have more memory available than we need for building four sums, but less than we need for building two sums? We can simply increase the base list by the amount of memory we get, uh, which forces us then to match the middle list to a bigger pattern, just to control the size of the list. And then we will generate more solution vectors in one iteration, since the lists are larger now, and they add up to zero on nearly all coordinates So by construction. So if we repeat this for different patterns, we will generate more solution vectors. But if we now repeat for all patterns, we will generate way too much solutions. And so we have to stop, stop at some point. And this point is exactly reached when the input and output list sizes are equal. So again, illustrating this in our graphic, uh, if we apply this tailoring technique to the schreppel shamir variant of our BKW, we achieve this solid line as trade-off, as linear interpolation between the original BKW complexities and the schreppel shamir variant of the BKW, which is, in fact, able to leverage the increase of, uh, of memory between these both complexities by decreasing the time complexity. And applying this technique to the other members of the dissection class and using them into our, inside of our framework, we achieve this solid lines as piecewise continuous trade-off. So, which is in fact able to leverage any increase of uh, memory by decreasing the time complexity. So, summarizing our results, uh, we give a first BKW variant that is applicable for any given amount of memory, which we achieved by abstracting solving the RPN problem via the BKW algorithm to solving the CSUM problem. And in this context, we give a generalization of the dissection technique, which is, in fact, a time memory trade-off for solving the CSUM problem via the dissection algorithms. Additionally, not addressed in this talk, but addressed in our paper, we give a first quantum version of the BKW algorithm, which is a trade-off. So it, uh, of course, performs worse in terms of time than the original BKW, but it forms the best 
trade-off so far, and our results are easily applicable to the LWE setting. Thank you very much.